This program is brought to you by Pussy Magnets. Put a man jogging friend with a Pussy Magnet. Welcome, welcome, my lovely lumps. Or should I say lovely labs? I'm so thrilled to have you here in the Labia Lounge to yarn about all things sexuality, womanhood, holistic health, and everything in between. Your legs. <laughs> Ah, I can never help myself. Anyway, we're going to have vag loads of real chats with real people about real shit. So buckle up, you're about to receive the sex ed that you never had and have a bloody good laugh while you're at it. Before we get stuck in, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm recording this, the Manang people. It's an absolute privilege to be living and creating dope podcast content on Noongar country and I pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Now, if you're ready, let's flap and do this. <laughs> oh God, is there such thing as too many vagina jokes in the one intro? <laughs> Whatever, I'm leaving it in. It's my podcast. Don't panic, you're not broken Your sex education was a piece of shit Get your flaps out and pull the couch It's the Labia Lounge What's happening, labial legends? I'm really excited today because we're covering a topic that is just so needed and so important Communication and conflict resolution in relationships And it's something that I think we could all stand to learn a bit more about and continually work on. So I've got an expert in these matters, James Gill, who's a heart coach and yoga teacher committed to all beings having access to the experience of love in their relationships, even in the moments where love seems to have gone missing, which is just such a beautiful mission. So welcome to the lounge, James. Pull yourself up a clip cushion. Um... And let me know if you'd prefer James or fish as well. God, I would love fish actually just because it's far more familiar. I've been called fish since I was six and I just turned 50. So fish is a well-worn path and I love it and it feels familiar and kind. So that'd be great. Oh, beautiful. All right. Can bloody do. So... Communication is something that I constantly find myself coaching people on and encouraging people to do more of in their relationships. And over the years, I've realized that it's actually a skill that way too many people are lacking, um, but that would pretty much answer like 80%, if not more, of the problems that people come to me for support with in their relationships and sex lives. So it's literally like that powerful and essential in my books but it's just not taught or modelled to most of us in a healthy way. So I want to talk about how we can do better in this department and like your videos on Instagram, on on socials are always so insightful and so heart-centred. So, I'm yeah, I'm really thrilled to be getting your input on the matter. (laughs) I'm thrilled to be joining you. So... What are some of the things, just to like launch straight in, what are some of the things that get in the way or act as a barrier to communication that you find through your work? Well, you know, when when I knew that we were going to be chatting, I was I was kind of reflecting on physical intimacy, you know, in our lives and how how much um it actually kind of relates to, you know, a segment that you commonly do. It's like I, I wish, I wish that 15, 16, 17, 18-year-old fish could have learnt, could have been told that physical intimacy is founded on emotional intimacy, which is not to say that we can't have sex without emotional intimacy, but if someone had said to me the best physical intimacy you will ever experience is when your heart and their heart is fully open I would have been well on my way to understanding (laughs) and um, avoiding a lot of um, difficulties in my you know explore trying to become a sexual being you know Um, and so you know there's a there's a barrier here I mean you know if we look at if I speak about the universal her, right, and I don't just mean the her in female form, I mean the her in all of us, 
she will she will open when she is felt into <clears throat> you know she will you know in terms of physical intimacy she wants to be felt into but that's founded on emotional intimacy where she just she just wants to be felt into she just wants to know that her experience is seen and validated and understood and when that happens she opens emotionally and perhaps if she's ready also physically so um so so here's the quandary right is that how does she get to be felt into when what she has to say will land on him or her or them as um as criticism or you're not doing what i like or you're not good enough or you're upsetting me or you're not thoughtful enough or like so her expressing you know this is kind of her primary complaint in relationship in the experiences that i've had for 13 years how do i get to invite my love into my world in such a way that they don't shut down or turn away or 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 feel hurt or feel criticized or get angry or shut me down or go missing um and and actually we're wired to go missing (laughs) because if we think of these moments as a perceived threat if they receive if they receive the message I'm giving you, which is actually, you know, I, I'm saying this is what I want more of, this is what's a bit upsetting to me, this is what I felt hurt by, all of which is a quest for emotional depth and emotional connection. On the other end, there's someone receiving that as you're upsetting, you're not good enough, you're disappointing, you've hurt me. And so they go missing because in the face of a threat, we go missing. It's our threat response. We, we close off, we shut down, we, we run away, we freeze, we fly. Um, so there's the quandary. Is sh- her quandary is how do I express my unmet needs in a way that I invite my partner in? And the partner's quandary is how do I stay present with my partner when what she's saying is so wrong (laughs) like so critical and so you know she's she's accusing me of this and that and this and and she's wrong so i just want to i just want to either fight back or go well this is she's crazy or that's unreasonable or i think you're being ridiculous or i think you've taken it the wrong way um so there's the quandary we're wired to pull away from one another when there's a perceived threat yeah, yeah, totally. And you're right. Like there, I, I don't know anywhere, I've never felt into any community where there's a very high level of baseline ability to stay very conscious in our communication. So instead we've just got these unconscious pathways which are about attack and defend, attack and defend. Mm-hmm. You know, even to the point where I, I, I often post on Instagram about having compassion for those who have done wrong by us and then I'm immediately met with a flood of messages to me saying how dare you dismiss my experience of pain and so we we wire these two things together we think that to be compassionate equals to condone some painful behavior to to make it okay but having a compassionate stance feeling into someone who's upset me is is not does not discount my ability to have a very clear boundary and maintain distance from that hurtful behavior Mm, yeah beautiful yeah well i mean that's that's a dynamic that i've noticed really commonly playing out is um like we're not on the same team you know when conflict arises there's this tendency to see it as like an oppositional thing like one's a victim one's a perpetrator you know it feels like they're on different teams and it's either an attack or you've got to really get on the defensive and um you know and then there's also that that like fight flight freeze response because conflict isn't something we've been like 
taught how to navigate safely and so you know I've noticed so many of us would rather keep the peace and just avoid all uncomfortable conversations or conflict rather than the vulnerability of going into the space of communicating about it Um, and then if they are um, sprung by a situation where they can't avoid it they don't have any tools and they they automatically are like, I'm being attacked or I need to defend myself or I need to um, point out all of the the faults and flaws so that I can at least blame someone and there's not a whole lot of responsibility or accountability. And we're just, we're just kind of at odds. Like we're on this, on these opposing teams, whereas it would be so much more productive and I guess foster so much more of a sense of safety if we looked at it with compassion, put ourselves in the other person's shoes and tried to come at it like from that angle, like, okay, we're both hurting, we're both on the same team and we love each other and we want to come to a resolution. So how can we go about that? Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm like wondering, like, do you resonate? Like, is that a common dynamic that you see where there's a victim and a perpetrator and, and like, are there other dynamics that arise when there's a communication breakdown? Well, that you've spoken directly to the very sort of crux of it. You know, something happens, some moment of uncertainty or upset or, or challenge happens between us. And then suddenly it feels like we're in opposing sides. The thing that I really want to stress is that neither of us chose opposition. It happens naturally in the mind because the mind is an either or machine. And in, in the face of threat or uncertainty, you know, which might just be having your partner say, hey, babe, where did you put my shoes? Like it could be as simple as that. In the face of a perceived threat or a perceived accusation or a perceived, you know, blame, our attention, because we're in our threat response already, our attention shrinks to our experience. My, my, My experience is alive in me. So all my attention is drawn into what's alive in me, right, which is everything I'd hoped for, everything I wanted, everything I was worried about, everything I was thinking and feeling and what was coming out of my mouth and just which is all a bit of a dog's breakfast anyway in my experience. It's like not congruent. It's a whole lot of things happening at once, often contradictory things. For example, I'm wanting to scream at you that you're an asshole and I'm also wanting to resolve it. So both of those things can coexist. So as my experience shrinks into my experience, as my awareness just wraps my experience, then my awareness cannot reach into your experience. And, you know, we all think of ourselves as empathetic beings, but our capacity to empathize with another being when we're in our threat response is zero or 1%, you know, whatever, it's minimized. So the work to do, and this is, this is, creating conscious pathways different to our unconscious pathways which will always be our default the conscious pathway here is to say okay i've got my experience and that's what my awareness is wrapped around but there's another experience over there which my which my awareness is has turned away from actually not not i didn't intend it but it's not in my awareness their experience is not alive in me so can i bring their experience into my awareness and allow my experience and their experience to be completely incongruent and both true when i can begin to expand my awareness into my experience and your experience then that's the truth of the matter just like any third party would from the outside go, well, you're both having valid experiences, right? But when we're in it, we're so compelled by the narrative that's in the mind about who we think they must be for us to have this pain <laughs> that we've shrunken into these two little dried up raisins which are opposite each other. And the fight, and the fight only deepens from that place. And here's, here's the other thing that's a bit, it's a bit sad to realize, but also kind of liberating is that then because I'm aware of my experience and you're aware of your experience the more I fight to be understood by you the more I leave you feeling misunderstood 
And the more you fight to be understood by me, in the absence of my understanding, the more I feel like you're dismissing my experience. Mm. And then quite quickly that escalates to having a fight that's got nothing to do with the fight. It becomes our assessment of them based on the fact that we're fighting. And then that escalates into horrible statements and and terrible behaviour that we might even term as abusive. But it's all based on a yearning to be understood. But we're actually creating the absence of understanding by demanding that we're understood. So then the remedy is how do I fight for mutual understanding? And if any one of the two people in a conflict takes a fierce stand for mutual understanding, I will not rest until you and I feel completely understood about all aspects of my experience and your experience. If I take that stand, it, over a matter of time, it, I can't lose. I can't lose if that's my commitment. It's just that unconsciously we're committed to being understood. And this, the work that I do is creating conscious commitment to mutual understanding, which actually means we have to relinquish a lot of the story. It's the assessment of them that we've come up with as a result of the pain that we're in. So we have to relinquish the story that says you're manipulative, you're a bullshit artist, you're conniving, you're deceiving, you're a control freak, you're a narcissist, you're a tyrant, you don't give a shit, you're just trying to have your own way, you're insensitive. We have to actually give up that narrative. So that's the, why, the, the reason that the whole world is not doing this because what a thing to give up. Because that narrative of the fact that they are a bit of a such and such, that's compelling and it's all over the world. Wow. Am I making some sense? I tend to ramble. No, you're making so much sense. Yeah. It's, oh, yeah. I love this. I love like delving into this because it's, I feel like it's something everyone faces and can relate to. And um, I, I've got a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. I can bring a little bit more clarity to it, even if you would like. Yeah, of if course. If we're on a good Go train here. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, so specifically, let's look at the two. There are two. You know, I mean, it, I mean, this is all just this is all just a way of thinking about it, right? I'm not even saying it's the truth, but it's a really powerful way to think about it. So, there's two unconscious assumptions that we make in conflict, right? So if I have, let's take, let's take, for example, my 22 year old daughter and it's her 22nd birthday. And I decide to get up and, and give a speech. And the speech that I give is not, it's not about taking the piss. It's just about saying what a incredibly kind, very warm, very thoughtful and funny human being she is and how much that means not just to me but to her mum to her sibling to to the whole community that's gathered and as I give this speech there's not a dry eye in the house because they're all just like yes you're speaking to the very essence of who this beautiful young woman is right and so there I am in my in just in my pure expression of love but there down the end of the table is my daughter and there's a look in her eyes that's saying, if you don't stop, I'm going to leave. And so there's a moment of conflict, right, because I'm trying to create this beautiful, loving environment, but she is experiencing it some other very different way. So I could make the unconscious assumption that because I'm loving her, the fact that she's feeling upset means that that's her shit or that something's wrong over there or that like how dare she or she's mistaken me or she's whatever, she's got it wrong, she's being unreasonable, she's hormonal, whatever way that we might use to dismiss, right? I would naturally unconsciously dismiss her pain or her upset because I'm standing in the reality, my reality, which is look at how beautiful I wanted this to be for her. <laughs> so we make this unconscious, number one unconscious um, assumption is 
just because I'm loving you, you should naturally receive it as love. Whatever I'm doing by loving you, you should receive it as love. And if you don't, the problem's over there with you. Does that, does that resonate? Mm -hmm. So, and, and some of that is like, some of that is not just the way I'm loving you, but maybe the way I'm loving me. Like if I, if I decide to go to take a couple of days to go bush, to, to get my thoughts together and come back so I'm a better man, I just make this assumption that just because I'm doing what is a great thing for me and a great thing for you ultimately, the fact that you're upset about it, it's like no way, you've got it wrong, how dare you? You're wrong for, you're falsely accusing me, you've got no idea, you've, you're making shit up, right? So now let's create the conscious decision or the conscious awareness that says a whole lot of the ways that I'm loving you are going to land in your world as not love. Mm. So then I can get really curious in every moment of every day, how is the way that I'm loving you landing as unlove for you? And then when that conversation's on the table, we've got emotional intimacy. Mm. So he or she can be saying to me, I actually felt upset when you did that thing. And I'm like, got it. So some, so I was trying this, I was wanting this, and actually it was received by you as this. God, that makes so much sense. How can we put that right? Mm. So that's unconscious assumption one. Unconscious assumption two is because what you did hurt me, you must be a hurter. Because what you did left me feeling excluded, you must be being exclusive. Because what you did leave me feeling criticized, you're critical. Because what you did left me feeling humiliated, you're nasty. Because what you did left me feeling um, embarrassed, you were belittling me. So this, we make this assumption that because I'm ex because this pain is in my experience and it's true for me and it needs to be tended to, right? I make the conscious, the unconscious assumption that that was your intention. So it's like the, it's like the opposite of the, of the first one. I, I will say you have ill intent because look at how all the ways you which you hurt me. But when it comes to my intention, I say you've got it wrong because I had good intent. And this is what the mind, what I've noticed the mind does in 100% of conflicts. We'll say, I'm a good person, so your pain must be a bit wrong. And my pain is real, so you must be a bad person. And the truth is, ready for the truth? <laughs> the truth is that in moments of conflict, my pain is alive in me. My pain is alive in me. And my pain is not at all what you'd hoped for. Now, half the planet is, you know, imagine the whole planet's jumping up and down now. Half the planet is liberated by that. Half the planet says, no, some people are just assholes. My, the pain in my life is evidence of that. And I'm not dismissing our pain. In fact, my coaching says, let's tend very deeply to our pain. But let's recognize that the pain I'm in is not ever what they had wanted. There's some core yearning in their heart that led them to take that step that we felt so upset by. Their yearning and my pain are different. Right. I'm not even saying that's the truth, but I tell you what, once you see people try that on in their relationships, wow. Like, I see the goodness in you, but what you did hurt me is the pathway to a beautiful conversation. And my yearning, my intention, of course it was beautiful. It's alive in me. Of course it's true. However, their pain is also true. It's unintended. We would never have wanted that pain for them. We wanted a bunch of other things. And we're clear about what we wanted. Or maybe we're not, but we can get clear about it. 
But when we learn to feel into the unintended pain that we have in every moment in relationship, then suddenly they have a place to open their hearts to us and express their upset and disappointment and fear in a way that we stay present to them and then we've got emotional intimacy, and then it's quite likely that five minutes later we'll be making love. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I'm a bit kind of like, I'm, a, I'm being a bit kind of um, silly with that, but actually in my life that's what's happened. The, the, the resolution, heart-based resolution of conflict leads us deeper into a feeling of togetherness, which naturally leads us into feeling safe enough to open. That was a lot, wasn't it? Oh, there's so much in there. I feel like everyone needs to just pause and like digest. Like I'm like, oh my God, fuck. Like I love these interviews because I just like I'm fascinated by the topics obviously that I choose and I'm like taking it all in and then I'm like, oh shit, I've got to ask another question now. Like I'm still trying to process everything that you just said because it's like so meaty. Um, yeah. So thank yeah. you for that. That was incredible. Yeah. Like, hey, babe town. So sorry to interrupt, but I simply had to pop my head into the lounge here and mention another virtual lounge that you've got to get around. It's the Labia Lounge Facebook group that I've created for listeners of the potty to mingle in. And there you'll find extra bits and bobs like freebies or discounts for offerings from guests who've been interviewed on the podcast, inspiring and thought-provoking conversations, and support from a community of labial legends. I also have an account on the fab new app Sunroom, which is a platform created by women for women and non-binary folk, and where there's no shadow banning or censorship of sex-positive content, unlike with the other platforms that I'm on. So you can hit up my sunroom for extra content and real and raw life updates because I'll be sharing on there from now on all of the stuff that I can't post anywhere else. My vision for both of these is that they become really supportive, educational and hilarious resources for you to have more access to me and a safe space to ask questions that you can't ask anywhere else. So head over to the links in the show notes and I'll hopefully see you in there. And now, back to the episode. Yeah, well, I'll come back to that situation with my daughter. I'll give an example. I'll, I'll use the situation with my daughter to make that a little more practical because that was a little, perhaps a little large and philosophical. <laughs> so back in, the, back in the situation with my daughter, down the road here in Frio, lots of food, amazing people, all my community, friends and, fa- and all their kids have all grown up together. It's just incredible. What a, what a tribe. And so my, what was in my heart was honouring my daughter, leaving her feeling very seen and very celebrated, but also like not in a huge uncomfortable way. I want it to, to feel kind of manageable and safe because I know she doesn't like to be fully spotlighted she likes to be quietly acknowledged um and i also i also wanted in my heart it was also true that i wanted to just express myself fully i wanted my love to come out of my face in terms of loving words because that's who i need to be in my relationships i need to express my love otherwise i need to probably go and find a different kind of relationship um So look how beautiful those two things are, right? Wanting to lift her up and have her celebrated and also wanting to be free in my expression of my love for her. That's my yearning. Over there in her world, the pain for her is something like dad's getting all emotional again, this has just got heavy, now all eyes are on me, I feel expected of to maybe respond I thought he knew, I, surely he knows I don't like it when he, do, when he does this. Um, this is his, this is his vibe, his like deep emotional vibe, not mine. Um, we had a good vibe going before he dinged his glass and wanted to speak. I feel embarrassed. I feel a bit angry and I feel a bit disregarded. And can't it be a celebration of me the way that I want? So you can feel how much like, it's like a disappointment. And like a and and an overwhelm, perhaps, mm-hmm. and a, like a what? There's a weightiness. It's like, oh God, Dad's doing his emotional thing again. Oh God, like weighed down by it, right? 
So you can so no, notice how valid those two things are. Yeah. And so working working with those two things, what I can say to her, what I did say to her is I could say, first of all, I want to honour my yearning because that's true and that opens my heart when my intention is seen. And second of all, I want to validate her pain because that's going to open her heart. So the statement I can make sounds something like, some of the ways in which I wanted to go about celebrating you and express my deep love for you and have you lifted up and really speak to the very essence of your heart left you, I think, feeling overwhelmed, disappointed, frustrated with me, even a bit hurt, like I hadn't really been considerate of you on the evening that was about you. So see how I've been able to hold in equal measure Mm -hmm. the goodness in my heart and the unintended pain I've created. Mm. So then working with the other two, the pain I was in was I was feeling like after when when she looked at me that way, I was feeling misunderstood, dismissed, criticized, hurt, Um, yeah, misunderstood because of what was in my heart and how she received it. I actually felt like, screw you for not receiving it with love, you know. So that pain is alive for me. What's what's her yearning and her intention of her heart is she's wanting to let me know she's upset. She's wanting to have her upset be seen and validated. She's wanting like more lightheartedness and more connection and less emotional weight. So on that, in those two, I could make a statement that honours my pain while honours the goodness in her heart, which says something like, I felt totally misunderstood and a bit made wrong by you, the way you looked at me, and I can see that what you were actually hoping for was to let me know that you were a bit upset with my approach. And the beauty of that, the beauty of letting me know is that you're contributing to our relationship. So what a wonderful thing to be wanting to do. And the way it landed was terrible for me. So the way you went about expressing yourself so that I was aware of your pain left me feeling pain. So see how we've just got these four kind of incongruent Mm. truths. I call them the four truths. Mm. The goodness in my heart landed as a crock of shit to you and the goodness in your heart landed like a crock of shit to me. And then once we can see those four, we can go, oh, wow, again? (laughs) And then we can start to do something about it. How might I celebrate you such that I don't leave you feeling so upset, darling? And here's how you might express your disappointment with my approach in such a way as I don't feel made wrong. And, and see there's this mutual willingness to clean it up. Mm. But really the two conscious things that we're doing is saying the love that I'm trying to convey to you doesn't land that way and the love that you have in your heart doesn't land that way for me. Mm. Yeah. And then the conversation becomes how can we land our love better? Mm. Yeah, totally. Amazing example. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks for being so tuned in. I'd love to do the segment Get Pregnant and Die just to um, break it up with a little storytelling and then I'm keen to launch into some more like practical stuff so that people can kind of take this and practice it in their own in their own life. But I, I loved that example. I'm really grateful for you sharing so vulnerably about a real life example that sounded pretty, yeah. you know, like present for you. So um, yeah. if you're if you're ready do you want to tell me a story about how your sex education uh failed you or you know a kind of sex ed related anecdote for the segment get pregnant and die don't have sex because you will get pregnant and die don't have sex in the missionary position don't have don't have sex standing up just don't do it promise Yeah, absolutely. Well, it it relates exactly to what I've been saying, really, that, you know, I wish, I wish my sex education had focused on how to be understood, how for me to feel completely understood by my woman, 
and how to leave her feeling completely understood because if i had if i had been given even the awareness that that was a thing that that was a foundational thing for physical intimacy then i probably would have started my life with a whole lot of communicating <laughs> and then a whole lot of really lovely tender open hearted warm exploratory moments but i can just go back to so many moments where i feel i felt so unsure about what was going on for her and i felt so much going on for me but i would never speak it out loud because i had this notion that somehow and i actually love cam how cam fraser speaks to this i had this notion that somehow sex was like performative like i had to just summon up this kind of sex god out of the blue and set aside my doubts and fears and confusion and 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 hope that she could do the same <laughs> and now ironically it's kind of like mm. I, i notice now that my my sensuality goes like goes off like a firecracker as soon as i can express so the relationship i've been in for the last year every time every single time that she came to me with upset and i was able to actually stay present to her in her upset such that she would just be able to rest in my my care my awareness my ability to just validate yes i see how upsetting that was for you she immediately would open open to me and and the dissolving of the barrier that she came to me with was simply by me bringing my full attention to understanding her using using those two um dissolving those two unconscious assumptions so i so the the more i thought to myself my love will always land poorly and here's another moment in which it does that made me open to understanding her pain and then she would just open to me and then i would i would use those opportunities to express what what i was yearning for in my heart that was distinct from the pain that she had and invite her into understanding how much i was longing for her joy her safety her well-being my safety my expression yearning for my love to land as love rather than how heartbreaking it was that it landed sometimes as unlove and these conversations would happen mm. and straight away where i felt like i wasn't particularly in a sensual or sexual space i immediately just felt this clarity and this power and i think maybe i know the word polarity is used a lot but i think that's my experience of polarity is when i could really stand in my truth and she could really stand in her truth and we could just honor each other and it was just this it's just this beautiful like opening of of my just my strength and power and opening of this softness and vulnerability in her not suggesting that that's the polarity that other people experience but so i feel like sex ed failed me because because it was mr dobby my science teacher who was this wizened old um i don't know wizened old man from some strange part of eastern europe pointing to diagrams of penises and vaginas and uteruses and cervix and and you know where the flow of things and it was like that if i if i had never seen a diagram of sex organs but got a lot of um awareness around communication i'm pretty sure i would have known where to put my penis <laughs> i'm pretty sure that would have looked after itself Yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> mm. uh, how to um, how to navigate closeness and cut and bring it back to openness, you know? And and how that naturally mm. just transfers into wanting to be 
wanting to touch, wanting to be close, wanting to feel the proximity, wanting to feel the breath. Like it's just, it's effortless when we clean up the shit that seems that it's in the way. Mm, Yeah. Yeah. Big time. And that kind of leads into the next question I had, which was about like the benefits of being able to clearly communicate um, with your partner. Like that is obviously a huge benefit is like the vulnerability and intimacy that it fosters. And then how that is reflected in the bedroom when you have such a sense of like safety and compassion and understanding for one another when you're on the same team when you know that you can you can tackle hard conversations like you know being vulnerable gives the other person permission to be vulnerable holding space for them and and you know allowing them to really trust you like and then how powerful that makes you feel like what a gift that is to share so I was wondering if you know you have any other examples of like what what a couples have when they can do this and communicate clearly and maturely that other couples don't who don't have that communication piece you know somewhat down pat because we can never always be perfect at that (laughs) yeah yeah well I think I think for me it's I mean I think I think one of the essences of um, wonderful intimacy, wonderful physical intimacy is emotional intimacy, as I've said, but also like, and that that's going to spring from being able to speak about my unmet needs such that I feel your willingness Mm. to meet me in my unmet needs and then my needs get to be met or Maybe they don't, but at least my unmet needs get to be seen, which may be actually even more powerful than my needs mm-hmm. being met because maybe the primary need is mm-hmm. for me to be able to speak to my unmet needs and you to be able to validate them. So then if we're, if we're talking about an unmet, like if we, if we zoom in on the bedroom, if we're talking about an unmet need, right, this is what's not working for me, this is what's disappointing me, this is what um this is what i want to feel more of you know which is a yearning an intention in our heart i would love to feel i would love to feel i would love to have more of a chance to kind of connect with you to feel into your heart to um to to feel your warmth to to hear about your day to talk about things other than the kids to, you know, I, I want to feel more into you before we make love, for example. And and the partner might receive that as I'm a bit disappointed in our lovemaking. <laughs> Quite naturally, it wouldn't take much for me to hear that as, oh, I'm doing something wrong or I've been disappointing you. How long have I been disappointing you for? Why didn't you... You know, so I would easily hear it as criticism. So then if we go back to person A, in order to be able to express those unmet needs, that yearning for needs to be met, for certain needs to be met differently, can we do that in such a way as we also create space for the unintended impact over there? So this is what I'm wanting more of and my love, I can imagine that me expressing that to you might even feel to you as if I'm saying you're somehow disappointing me. The more I want to express myself about my needs, the more it might feel to you as if I'm criticizing you. I don't want that for you, but it would make sense if it was landing that way for you. So see how we're just creating a container for them to be able to express, yes, when you say that to me, I feel like I'm not man enough or I feel like you're saying you're disappointing or you would like to be with some other kind of lover or, you know, or I feel I feel worried that this has been going on for a long time or I feel kept in the dark or I feel ambushed by this. And we can actually just say, yes, it makes sense that there's this impact on you through me sharing what I want. And, and what can we do about that? You know, how do we, how do we tend to the pain that happens for you when I say that and the yearning that's alive for me when I say that mm. rather than me speaking my needs and thinking that me speaking my needs should just be received by them as wonderful because otherwise they must not love me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so creating space for 
our partners to express the pain that is alive in them that we would never have wanted for them rather than make the assumption that they shouldn't have upset because we're a good person and they must be ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. Um, it's so it's something that just sort of popped into my mind slightly unrelated is like about apologizing and, and how to give a good apology that's not just like, oh, well, I'm sorry you feel like that, but that's wrong or, like, that's not how I intended it, so, like, shut the fuck up, you know. Like, it's very tricky, <laughs> very, very tricky <laughs> to, to like, and, you know, I feel like I have to remind myself sometimes that my love for my partner is more important than being right and, and we're both quite stubborn and so we're both, like, getting better and better. We're really good at, like, seeing it from the other person's perspective, anticipating how that other person might be receiving our love in, in a way that we're not intending or receiving a certain tone of voice or something that we are bringing up um, and then, you know, anticipating that and then trying to account for that. But it's really complicated and, and also because we're stubborn and, you know, there is that tendency to feel triggered, you know, have our own insecurities flare up or whatever. Um, it can be hard to be like, okay, you know, I'm always trying to be like, okay, so I'm hearing or I'm feeling that you are having this experience and you're feeling like this and that is so valid and I want to acknowledge that. I'm really sorry that me saying this thing made you feel that way. But then sometimes I feel like it's 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 like you can accidentally bypass. You can be like, well, I'm sorry that you're feeling that way, but it's not how I intended it. So like, it's not my problem, you know. Like, it's really tricky to give a good apology that does what you want it to do and isn't just another sly, backhanded attack. Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, do you want me to speak more on that? Yeah. <laughs> how do we give a good apology? <laughs> Excuse the interruption, my loves, but I'm shamelessly seeking reviews and five-star ratings for the potty because, as I'm sure you've noticed by now, it's pretty fab, and the more people who get to hear it, the more people it can help. Reviews and ratings help me curry favor with the algorithmic gods and get suggested to other listeners to check out. Plus, they make me feel really good and appreciated as I continue to pour my heart and soul into creating this baby for you. And I promise I don't maz over them or anything. I mostly just tuck them away for a rainy day when I'm filled with self-doubt and existential dread about being self-employed, which is fairly frequently. <laughs> so you see, leaving a review really does make a difference and it's an easy little act of support that you can take in just a minute or two by either going to Spotify and leaving five stars for the show or writing a written review and leaving five stars over on Apple Podcasts. Choose your poison, or if you're a real overachiever, you could do both. Whoa now. If you are writing a review, though, just be sure to only use G-rated words, because despite the fact that this is a podcast about sexuality, words like sex can be censored and your review won't actually show up. Lame. Anyway, oh, oh, what was that? Oh, you're going to go do it right now while I wait. Okay. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great idea. May as well just quickly click that five-star button before we get on with it and, you know, like forget about it and get on with your day. Um, um, oh, I'm hearing them roll in. I'm hearing those five stars. <laughs> oh, my God. I make myself cringe. Anyway, uh, thank you much, Lee. You're a total gem, and I'll let you get back to the episode now. Yeah, cool. Well, first of all, I don't think the the word sorry cuts it. I'm not against people I'm not against using the word sorry in my apology, but the word sorry itself means nothing. It's like it's like the apparition of an apology. It's like I want to be seen for for making amends, but I'm just going to offer the word sorry which is actually kind of vacuous actually. Mm -hmm. It can even just feel like like a limp offering to shut you up. Oh, sorry then. Mm. Okay, sorry, but I said sorry. Okay. Why are you still going on about it? I said sorry. So it's got no meat to it. It's got no essence to it. Mm. On the other end of the spectrum, you cannot use the word sorry, like chuck out the word sorry, but what I think the essential ingredient is, when you think about it, when you think about what you have wanted someone to apologize to you for, it's that you want your pain 
acknowledged. That you want your experience, particularly the, the, the aspect that was upsetting for you and the impact it had as well, what it meant that you then had to do or what you might have less, lose, lost sleep over or the fact that the next few days at work were difficult for you or the fact that like you carried this sense of like not feeling cared for. When I can reach into, if, you, if I'm apologizing to you, when I can reach into your pain, and that takes a bit of work, right? Because remember, the unconscious assumption is that you shouldn't have pain because I didn't want pain for you. I didn't do something in order that you suffered. Mm. So the fact that you say, hey, I'm suffering, I, I'm naturally, in, unconsciously, I'm just going to pull away and go, how dare you? I just want to defend that I'm a good person, I didn't do anything wrong. That's what happens unconsciously. So the conscious pathway is to say, okay, my partner's presenting upset to me and they want me to tend to their upset. So I can say, I can totally see how angry, hurt, frustrated you felt when I did that thing. So point to the thing, point to what the action you took was, and point to the pain, the experience of pain alive in them, and then wrap that in validity and context. It makes sense that you're upset about that because I know how tender that moment was to you, or after the last few days that we've had, this must have felt like just another thing, or I know this topic is particularly sensitive to you, so it must have really felt painful to you, or it makes sense that you felt so alone because you must have felt like I didn't even care about what you were experiencing. So notice how I'm just wrapping it in context mm. such that their pain gets to be even more validated. Now, what I'm not doing is agreeing with their assessment. So if the way they've come to me with up their upset is to say, you're selfish or you don't give a shit about me or you, what you said to me yesterday was really cruel. All of that is in the realm of assessment. My job to do a really good apology, my job, rather than defend against the assessment, is to ask the question, what's the pain that they're speaking of behind their accusation? So, so if my daughter had come to me and said, um, I can't believe you did that, Dad. You're just like, you're so annoying. My natural tendency would be to say, excuse me, I, most 22-year-old daughters would love a father to be that loving to them openly, right? So that's me defending my intention. But instead, and, that, and you can do that if you want, but every time you defend your intention and they want you to feel the pain, the, the gap between you widens and good luck with that. <laughs> It turns into Russia, Ukraine, actually. Um, but then, so instead, I can just say, what's the pain she's speaking to? What would make her come to that conclusion? Well, clearly she felt not cared for in some way. Clearly she was upset with my strategy. What's the pain that my strategy might have created for her? Well, I guess, I guess it might have not quite felt like her vibe. <laughs> It might have felt a bit full on, a bit teary, a bit loving, a bit spotlight on her. And that must have actually probably felt unfair. And actually, for context, I know that that kind of vibe is, is the sort of vibe she finds hard from me. So then I can say to her, mm -hmm. that situation now upon reflection must have felt really weighty for you and not at all what you felt like at the time. And I know that those situations in the past have also felt uncomfortable. So it must have even felt as if I didn't care about what you wanted. And when I say that, she starts to just open because no longer does she need to fight against me for her pain to be understood. Instead, I'm fighting for her pain to be understood as well. So the fight goes. And then... Finally, I can just help her understand what I was actually hoping for that was magnificently beautiful and reassure her again that I can see that it didn't, wasn't received that way at all. So I can say, you know what, 
it's heartbreaking to see how much upset I've created for you because I wanted you to skip away feeling totally celebrated for the incredible young woman that you are. And here you are feeling like I completely disregarded what you wanted the night to be like. And as I hold those two, no one gets to be wrong. Can you feel that? I get to be right for what I'd hoped for and she gets to be right about how it was received. Gorgeous. Yeah. So beautiful. in essence, speak to the pain, speak to the action that led to the pain and give context and validity to their pain. And then you might share what you'd hoped for and how, how you know, I often talk about my intention was a jungle, a fertile jungle with hummingbirds and what you received was like a stony desert with a broken down car <laughs> you know the the landscapes are so different yeah, yeah. Mm, I've had that sort of uh scenario go down quite a few times and it's often a, a sort of um difference in love languages as well and I'm like all about the huge romantic gestures and super emotional and I'm just like so pumped about how that's going to make them feel because it's how it would make me feel and they're just like ah this is way too much like this is not my jam and actually that's like um given me the inspiration um to share a tmi story i think um we spoke earlier and you're not going to share one because you don't want your daughter to hear it (laughs) um so maybe i'll step up and it's not a sexual based tmi story because um people may not realize this but tmi can also be all sorts of other stuff that people might usually not speak about um but i have this like really funny it's like a running joke about having dad crushes because um, if you've listened to last week's episode on narcissism, I sort of mentioned in passing about my complicated relationship with my dad and I remember as a kid like watching play school and there'd be these cutaways to like a happy family having a picnic and the dad was like just so like lovely and warm and he didn't (laughs) yell at his kids and he was not like controlling and a total psycho and I was always like oh my god wish I had a dad like that and I would watch like the ABC news reporter and had a mad dad crush on him he was like 60 can't remember his name (laughs) Peter Cundall from Gardening Australia oh my god so pretty much now like me and my partner have this running joke like anytime I'm watching something on TV or we meet someone like just a nice friendly sort of fatherly figure I'm like oh I wish he was my dad and I get dad crushes on people because I'm like starved of that like warm emotionally connected father figure and so you're telling me this story and your daughter's like not receiving it and I'm like oh my god can you come to my birthday I want you to be my dad yeah yeah exactly (laughs) so yeah newfound dad crush and isn't it like that's so beautiful I love that and isn't it like isn't it interesting that it's actually so that's just such a beautifully illustrated thing where it's the emotional presence that you're seeing or that you you're seeing the story of played out on telly and then and then the kind of crush aspect comes in and says that's kind of what I you know it's kind of what I just naturally want to feel open to and I guess you know it's like that's Mm. It is the the weaving together, and I'm not. You haven't framed it sexually, but it is the weaving together of like, like I desire safety and connection in all aspects, and so of course you kind of crush on what you see to be warmth and presence and and protectiveness mm-hmm. and um, strength and mm-hmm. presence. Presence, I think, is the aspect of. You know, what I, what I coach people in is how to stay present through their communication and how to, how to illustrate their presence when naturally we go missing from each other because it feels threatening. So thank you. That's lovely. I love that. I'm going to, every time I see Peter Cundall, I'm going to think of you. <laughs> He's just the best. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh yeah pleasure well I'm glad that story so good. tickled you um so I have a <laughs> I've got a, a question I reckon a lot of people will be able to relate to this um 
What about, so I've, I had a friend who had this scenario quite recently, actually. What about when one person is like really trying hard to communicate and trying to take responsibility and ownership of their part in, you know, conflict or in a relationship breakdown, as was the case with my friend, and they're like being really open and, and maturely communicating and saying, hey, like I own, I own my part in this. But then the other person doesn't want to or isn't able to like come to the party and you know they actually rather than taking responsibility for their own part and and coming to this great you know being able to communicate about it um they just see it as a victory and an opening to then go yeah well and then start blaming the other partner who's being accountable and it's like yeah rather than an opportunity to recognize um and take accountability and meet in the middle they actually are just going straight into like, cool, well, that person's just um, owned up to their part, which means I can go, yeah, well, I was right and I can keep blaming you. And then it's just this like imbalance. Um, Like, do you see it that happening? And like, what, 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 what do we do in that scenario when like, we're trying to be the bigger person and we're trying to acknowledge how we contributed to the conflict or whatever it was but the other person is like not quite there and they're not meeting us and then it actually just becomes like a crossing of boundaries and then being like yeah well you totally are to blame and you were wrong and like I am right and it's just like oh that's not that's not how I meant this to go (laughs) hey me again If you'd like to support the potty and you've already given it five stars on whatever platform you're listening on, I want to mention that you can buy some really dope merch from the website and get yourself a labia lounge tote, tea, togs. Yep, you heard that right. I even have labia lounge bathers or a cute fanny pack if that'd blow your hair back. So uh, if fashion isn't your passion, though, you can donate to my Buy Me A Coffee donation page, which is actually called Buy Me A Soy Chai Latte because... I'll be the first to admit, I'm a bit of a Melbourne cafe tosser like that. And yes, that is my coffee order. (laughs) You can do a once-off donation or an ongoing membership and sponsor me for as little as three fat ones a month. And I also have a Sunroom profile over on the Sunroom app, as I've mentioned. And I also offer one-on-one coaching and online courses that'll help you level up your sex life and relationship with yourself and others in a really big way. So every bit helps because it ain't cheap to put out a sweet podcast uh, into the world every week out of my own pocket. So I will be undyingly grateful if you support me and my biz financially in any of these ways. And if you like, I'll even give you a mental BJ with my mind from the lounge itself. Saucy. And um, I'll pop the links in the show notes. Thank you. Later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Good. Great question. Um, so. The first thing I want to talk about regarding that is the fact that when we're in our analysis of what happened, which might sound like, oh, yeah, I can see that, you know, I reacted that way because of this and because of that and that's probably there and I realized that I just brought my childhood stuff into there and I like and that's probably why and, you know, that might sound like being responsible in our communication but we're still in analysis and analysis calls for counter analysis so if i give you my analysis of why we had a conflict you will have a slightly different or radically different analysis of why we had a conflict and then we're just in the conflict of our analysis about the conflict so instead what i want people to start becoming masterful at is What's the experience? What's the experience? Not not why, not whose fault, not how much I'm responsible and how much you're responsible, not what we should have done, not what we shouldn't do, but what actually was experienced, what was, what was felt over there and over here, and what was wanting over there and over here. And there we're in the truth. And the, and the feeling into the experience of it never, never goes oppositional unless we're comparing truths me versus you but if i'm if i'm making space for your yearning and your pain and my yearning and my pain to exist it can't go shit shaped because all we get to is a deeper understanding of the complexity of our experience right so i so first thing i would 
I would I coach people in is get out of the analysis that you just got into and then get out of it again and then get out of it again and then get out of it again because we're very clever, very clever, and we like to mm. make things mean things. What I make it mean and what you make it mean, if they're different, we're screwed because there we are in. Now we're going to be making an assessment of how I feel, what sort of person you are, that your truth is different to mine. And we'll come up with terms like gaslighting, which I, mm-hmm. I think is actually, for me, it breaks my heart because, because gaslighting is actually just one person saying, no, I don't think you should have had that pain. And they're saying that because they didn't yearn for the pain that they unintentionally created. So we all gaslight. When someone comes to us and says, you caused me pain, we go, I don't think I did actually. That's not what I was doing. Right, so anyway, that's probably going to be a hot topic. (laughs) Um, So what I would suggest then is responsibility in communication is not saying, oh, yeah, I own some of it or now I realize where it came from. It's saying I'm willing to stand with you in your experience and share my experience and just just share and stand and stand and stand and if they are still in the mode of yeah well that means you're wrong and I'm right there's still pain that is yearning to be understood in them that's what gives rise to their assessment that they're right and we're wrong if their assessment is that we're wrong they're actually saying I've still got pain that hasn't been acknowledged so acknowledge the pain now that all being said if you reach a point where in a relationship for a bunch of months or a bunch of years, their capacity to meet you in teasing open the experiences that you both had. If they can't stand there, and by the way, many people can't because they've never been trained to. In fact, they've been trained not to, i.e. generations of men and generations of women have been trained in not paying attention to the experience but going straight into the analysis and what we decide about it. So if your partner can't meet you over a period of time in being willing to explore what was your experience, what was my experience, then you're not ever going to feel understood by them and then you'll have two pathways. One is to just swallow what you need to be understood about which will lead you to resentment or you'll explode with it in a vitriolic way which will deepen the conflict. So if, you know, and I, I, I sort of I qualify this because the ways in which people unconsciously try to resolve conflict actually deepen conflict. <laughs> but if you can create space for their pain to be validated and your pain to be validated and for the goodness in their heart to be seen and the goodness in your heart to be shared by them, understood by them. If you're creating that space and over time they can't get into what was my experience or what was your experience, then, I mean, up to you. Sometimes I get messages from people saying I've spent 20 years in an abusive relationship and I and I kind of am left scratching my head saying why would you spend 20 years in an abusive relationship? Now I know that's kind of oversimplifying the ways, the mechanisms by which we can really get tied in and like looped in, right, and not not kind of have the support or the strength to make a move. But let's, let's keep on the table the notion of is this relationship a place where I get to feel understood? And if it's not, well, what am I, like what work am I going to put in? And if the work that we're putting in is not getting anywhere, well, what, you know, it's like could, couldn't I be somewhere where I wasn't left feeling totally misunderstood. I think it's really healthy to discuss healthy ending of relationships, like compassionate ending of relationships. Um, I think I've just experienced one. Um, I think that's where it's at. It's just kind of like our, our unmet needs have been kind of spoken about and held and we can't, we don't think we can quite find the way to 
go ahead such that both sets of needs are met. And then, and then it's like, well, then loving each other looks like not expecting to be in relationship with each other. And I think that, you know, that, that's different to the romantic notion that we're kind of used to. But I love you so much that, that I think we best not be together is a valid approach. Mm, yeah, absolutely. It is it is really tricky to know when to call it, I suppose, and I think people get quite invested. They're like, oh, they've put in this many years and I've put in this much effort and there were those great times and we do love yeah. each other so much and so we might stay in something a lot longer than probably would yeah. be good for either of us. Um, yeah. And I'm often coaching people through that and just being like, hey, like, don't know if you've thought about this, but have, have you kind of considered that maybe you're just <laughs> – not good for each other like it's just you're not quite going to line up and and the longer you spend the more damage yeah. you're doing and that the most loving thing to do for both of you would be to walk away and and accept that like you've done your best you tried but it's just not yeah it's not healthy to remain in something where you're like ships passing yeah. in the night and you just cannot meet in the middle and make it work yeah, so, yeah, wow, that's big. Thank you for sharing such a personal yeah, example of this kind of playing out in your life right now. Mm. So I've got like an, I'm conscious of time. I've just got probably one or two more questions. I guess I want to leave people with um, – with some, I mean, you've given so many practical examples and, and strategies, but I suppose I'm wondering, is there any, um, anything you would like to words for people or, you know, a little parting tip to inspire them, um, to go and take away and implement in their practice of their communication skills in their relationship? Um, yeah, that they can kind of take and remember next time they are faced with a situation where they're like, oh, my God, what did what did Fish say? Like, what am I meant to be doing right now? <laughs> You've kind of already um, specified, but, yeah, just to clarify, yeah. like one or two steps, yeah. Um, I would say notice the unconscious commitment to being understood and in doing so notice how it naturally creates like it amplifies their upset when we need them to understand us because it feels to them like we're not willing to understand them. And we get into this deadlock. It's a little bit like I will only if you will. And if you're not going to feel into me, then screw you. I'm not going to give you that same kindness. So notice the unconscious commitment to being understood and the damage that does. And that might that might be kind of fairly confronting to recognize <laughs> because in those moments of conflict, our experience tells us we are right, so they must be wrong. And this is the way that wrong and right notion of the mind screws with reality because they're right and we're right, actually, in truth. Not about our assessment, but our, about our experience. So once you notice that, see if you can find ways to demonstrate that you are committed to mutual understanding. And some, some I don't know if you've ever used a talking stick, but being able to pass a stick to someone or an object to someone and say, you get to speak for as long as you need to speak. And I'm just afford you that space because from this, we get you to feel understood and that's what I want for both of us is you to feel understood I want that for you I also want that for me because this is a loving relationship so create space for mutual understanding um, and the way that we do that take it even deeper and not just not just the surface level thing of I hear you which just drives me nuts because I hear you really says, I don't hear you, but I want something to say to try and indicate that I do. <laughs> Instead, bring validity to what they're saying, not their assessment, not what they're accusing you of, but actually what they felt beneath that. I see how angry that must have made you. Of course it did. Of course you're upset right now. That made so much sense to me that you felt hurt. I didn't want it for you, but it makes so much sense to me that that's what you felt. Given what's been happening, of course, this was high impact for you. It makes sense that you felt really lonely. 
now that makes so much under it's so much sense because of what you've already shared what we've been going through and that must even have felt like this for you on top of what was already so we're just just bathing their experience in validity because guess what their experience even if different to what we'd hoped for is alive in them and the pathway to transformation it only is only you and I have our experiences tended to. There's no other pathway to transformation. We could come to an agreement where we agree to disagree and slightly resent each other and find a way forward, but transformation is when my story and your story about this moment shifts forever and the victim-villain story is dissolved. So deep validity to bring mutual understanding is the way that someone no longer has to be the villain and someone no longer has to be the victim and that's love victim villain Mm. is the absence of love Mm. yeah gosh it is like a constant practice though it's so tricky to put your pride aside and that that sort of urge to be right and to kind of like it's so hard (laughs) but um but it's so, such an amazing feeling when it works well and when you do kind of come out the other side of a conversation and you're just like, wow, I feel closer than ever and I've just collected all of this information about you and about how you work, how you communicate best. Um, and I guess like so just one last question because it's just something that is um, I've spoken with my partner about quite a bit is like um, – the communication styles with which we have are quite different. We're, the families were brought up in very different. Um, and I hear a lot of people, especially from like quite, uh, I guess, like fiery cultures like Italy or whatever, where they're like, no, like conflict is healthy. Like we yell at each other and we have these big thing, like big fights and then we're all just happy family afterwards. And And I know that like my communication style can be a bit more sharp um, and the way my partner Lockie receives it is quite like, like I've described it before as it's like I've kicked a puppy, like a Labrador. Ouch. Yeah. And so I've had to really work on like, <laughs> you know, like bringing my tone down to a softer level and like, I don't yell, but you know, it is, it's quite blunt. I'm pretty matter of fact, I'm pretty like boom, boom, boom. Um, and that's just cause that was normal for me. And I'm wondering like, is there a, level of um you know when people are like no but like conflict is healthy this and that and I'm like hmm yeah yeah like I feel like communication about a situation that created conflict is healthy but but I don't think you should just be like staying in a relationship where you're like constantly fighting I think like some level of crunchy conversation is really good especially in the early years when you're really nutting it out and you're figuring out how one another ticks but like what would you say on that on that topic of like how much conflict is healthy what about the like style with which you communicate things I know that's probably a whole podcast on its own but yeah just if you have something to say on that, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> sure. Well, firstly, I want to I want to validate the fact that many of us come from families where, um, when something was up, the the dominant culture was let's not talk about what's up, because if we can't talk about what's up without making it worse for some of us, mm-hmm. let's just not do it. So I want to validate avoidance as a strategy. Mm-hmm validate what's behind the intention behind avoidance which is let's not make things worse right it's not a skillful strategy but it is committed to peace (laughs) i also want to validate the approach which might have us sling shit at each other for hours throw pots and pans and call each other names because that strategy is based on the intention of full expression and finding resolution by expression. So what a valid intention. However, the unintended damage that we might do through that, and I've spoken to a lot, spoken to a lot of families that had that model. Um, it does damage, right? You might say, Oh yeah, we've got it out of our system, but that thing can't be unsaid that we said in the heat of the moment that we now regret. So I, I wouldn't vouch for either approach necessarily. But they're both both based on valid 
intentions of keeping the peace or finding resolution. What I would say is for conflict to be held, I mean, conflict is inevitable and let's think of conflict as the rising of unmet needs. And the deeper that we go in our love, the more unmet needs will rise because they get to be seen. <laughs> They're there and they just get to be seen because the deeper that we interbe with each other, the more we have to start becoming aware of needs as they go unmet and how we might together meet those needs. So conflict is just what happens around unmet needs because we're not skillful at acknowledging and discovering and inquiring about unmet needs. Um, so, of course, a healthy level of conflict is however much you have to talk about unmet needs. But I wouldn't say fighting is necessarily great because fighting tends to just indicate that you've gone into the oppositional model of discussing your unmet needs. Mm -hmm. Whereas you can be in an aligned model of unmet needs, which is everything I've been talking about, which says a bunch of ways in which I love you must feel unloving to you. What can we do about that? Yeah. Um, so that's an aligned model. So then I would say the mastery is, hey, I notice that we're oppositional. How can we bring our awareness around what's going on for us such that we can take this deeper into love? Um, so I wouldn't vouch for screaming and yelling and I wouldn't vouch for turning away, but I get it. I get it. I've done both. And they were unconscious strategies to try and get to a better place. Mm. Yeah. Amazing. Beautiful. Love that. Thank you so much. Oh, wow. This has been one of my favorite interviews so far. Really appreciate your time and all of your thoughts and stories. And, and yeah, if, if you've got any, um, I think you mentioned some retreats coming up that you might want to um, tell people about or any offerings that you've got, please plug away. Great. Well, I don't know when this is going to be out there for public ears to wrap around, but, um, but I have a retreat in the Hunter Valley in New South Wales on the, starting on the 20th. It's four days and four nights and it's a, it's a deep dive into practical tools to bring those moments of upset back to mutual understanding of love in any moment in any kind of relating that's for singles and couples um i have a similar retreat that i'm collaborating on with uh masoga wallace from masoga and that's going to be that's going to be come back to these communication tools plus hands-on restorative yoga which i don't know if you've done but sleepy yoga it's amazing it's just like dropping into bliss that's in november on magnetic island in queensland planning retreats in the u.s and bali next year and we'll be back in perth running retreats singles and couples retreats over here as well um my online communication coaching can be found at leadbyheart.com and if you want to get the vibe of what I do, you can go to Instagram. I share little snippets of the tools, but they're not the whole, it's not the whole thing. But if you put all my videos together, you'd probably get kind of the way I work. Um, yeah, and it's really is just my role is to just show you how to bring validity to you and them in every second of your existence such that hearts can be open. Mm, gorgeous amazing so powerful so important and I think not to put you on the spot you can totally go back on this I think you mentioned in your booking that you might have a little discount for listeners for the retreat so if you do I'll pop that in the labia lounge Facebook group for people but also no pressure I can also edit this out <laughs> got it I am I am happy to offer a discount what they might do is um dm me directly on Instagram or email me directly, fish at leadbyheart.com, and I can arrange a Labia Lounge discount specially. Beautiful. Thank you. Really appreciate that. And that's it, darling hearts. 
Thank you for stopping by the Labia Lounge. Your bum groove in the couch will be right where you left it, just waiting for you to sink back in for some more double L action next time. And in the meantime, if you'd be a dear and subscribe, share this episode, or leave a review on iTunes, then you can pat yourself on the snatch because that, my dear, is a downright act of sex-positive feminist activism. And you'd be supporting my vision to educate, empower, demystify, and destigmatize with this here podcast. Also, I'm always open to feedback, topic ideas that you'd love to hear covered, or guest suggestions. So feel free to get in touch via my website at freyograph.com or say hey over on Insta. My handle is Freya underscore graph underscore YMT, and I seriously hope you're following me on there because damn, we have fun. We have fun. Anyway, later labial legends. I'll see you next time.